Hey, thanks for joining me for another of your favorite Nordic CEO stories brought to you by the She Community. Before we get started, uh, we're several episodes in now, uh, and I hope you're enjoying what we're doing. Um, but if you're not, or if you think there's an area we can improve, let us know. Hit us up at, at She Community on Instagram or go to shecommunity.com or even email me or message me directly at Matt C. Smith on Instagram or whichever channel in the social world. And I'd be happy to see if I can even give you some top tips from the conversations we've had with some of the CEOs. And I'm your host, as you well know by now, Matt C. Smith. And in this episode, I'm joined by a leader who can only be described as the leader of leaders, that's right. I'll let you figure out what that means. He's built up two billion knock companies, both been sold, and is an investor in, in some of Nor Norway's hottest technology companies like Disruptive Technologies, Air Things, Ardoc, Zivid, and the list really does go on. And he's very acquisitive today. So the gentleman is Guy Furra, who's the managing partner of Firma, uh, uh, as well as, as I said, just about the chairman of every interesting Norwegian tech company. Guy, welcome to the show, mate. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Guy, famous question, uh, what do you have for breakfast? But I have a feeling that it's CEO of startups. That's what you eat for breakfast. Uh, not, not exactly. Uh, well, I'm not a morning person. So um, my, uh, my, I'm, I'm, I have always been a B type person. So I'm, uh, I'm more like I'm starting the day being depressed kind of before I get up and uh, before the shower. But after the shower is fine. But I'm not really a morning person. Has improved over the years. Uh, better now than before. But uh, um, so evenings has always be better than mornings for me. <laughs> I think that's, that's an age old, um, misconception that every A type successful person gets up at 5am. We've all seen and read the, I call it, um, founder porn, which is basically just these rhetorics online on social media that are get up at 5am, get up at 6am. And so it's good to hear that not everyone who is successful in these domains isn't uh, also a morning person as well. Ooh. But Guy, um, I want to talk a little bit about your, you know, your history because we've had a few CEOs on the show already. And obviously, you know, the, the aim of this show, and I know you listening to this at home probably know this by now, is to sort of understand a little bit more about leadership, uh, leadership qualities, uh, and the human side behind leaders, uh, our favorite Nordic CEO leaders. And there's a running trend now, Guy, I've noticed between yourself and Sigve Brekke, Isabel Alverberg, that you're a small town guy, aren't you? I'm a small town guy, yes. I'm not sure whether that is a uh, criteria for, be, for, 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 for being a successful uh, leader in the society, but I, I don't think it, uh, it, it's not a disadvantage, I think, because... Uh, coming from a small place, I think you are a bit more grounded than uh, than uh, coming from a bigger place. And I think being grounded is a good uh, a good good asset to have uh, being a leader. Mm. And I think that's the misconception that you know it's very difficult to progress career wise if you're from small towns and, and other places. And I think actually Norway obviously is a nation of small towns, really, isn't it? I mean, it's a, it's a very large nation with a small population spread across a large, vast landscape. Even in Norway, there was kind of a people outside of Oslo view people from Oslo to be different. But I think the differences here in this country, as you say, is is much smaller than in many other countries. It, that's exactly that's a very good point as well mm. what was your first job is a question that comes to mind when i think of ceos that we see today all the organizations you're involved in uh, you're a leader charismatic in the field we see you in the media all the time but what was your first job what sort of got you started in your career you mean after education or being a, being a youngster before the first, first official yeah, job that, first, that sort of conditioned you my <laughs> first job as uh well my first job i would say was to be i run a f I run a farm together with my father when i was 12 so it was a small one and he had a he had a separate job as an electrician but it's a more, more kind of a hobby but still we had animals and i was running that farm with him so that was my kind of my first first job and then parallel with that i was working for a guy having a greenhouse, I was doing uh, all sorts of uh, farming things, actually. That's how my career started uh, as a so youngster. From farm, far, 
farm to technology, how did you make that step? Because obviously today, as I mentioned, you're involved in Air Things and Aradog Zivid, all of which are sort of very, uh, you know, I, we're talking about Internet of Things, we're talking about deep technologies that are really impacting both Norway and the globe at the moment. How did you take that step from the farming world to the technology world? Uh, I think it's a big, um, I, I think I'm a born engineer. I was always building things. So that's that's one answer to that. But, uh, but beyond that, it was by obviously by chance or that I ended up in ele- ele- electronics and, 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 and computers and so on. So uh, I, maybe because my, my older sister chose uh, that path and my father was an electrician. So maybe that's it was simple as that. I believe so. Mm-hmm. I know especially, because I'm, that- I've never been really interested in technology as such. And, and maybe many people have, who knows me have a trouble know what I'm doing, have a trouble understanding and believing that because I've been engaged in high-tech companies and some of the most high-tech companies in, in, in Norway. But, but still, mm. it's still true. But I think it's been an asset for me, actually, not to be that deeply interested because I'm, I'm, the problem with startups or technology companies or kind of ventures in general is often that the founders or the entrepreneurs are so deeply interested in the technology that they forget about all, all the rest. And uh, I've been having the asset of, I, th- I think I'm good with people. I've been able to find good people, identify good people, and also very good engineers and, and uh, product people. And, and the combination of those with me has been, I think, a success formula. How do you spot good people? Sorry? How do you spot good people? I mean, you are obviously an investor in many companies. Uh, as I called you at the beginning of this podcast, the leader of leaders, because you are often the chairman, you have a board seat, uh, a controlling decision on that company's uh, decision-making process uh, at the board level. Uh, how do you decide on an entrepreneur and how do you decide that that individual is going to be one you're going to invest in? Uh, that's that's really tricky, and and and, and it's uh, you can never. There's not never a hundred percent safeness or security in in those things. But I think with time, having dealt with many kind of people, uh, you you see a pattern of people that uh, you like to work with, and and people that you believe can prevail and 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 do the job, and especially. Especially challenging, of course, as a, as, a, as a chairman on the board of several companies. Uh, the, the most important, the most important job for a board is really to find the right captain on on the ship for for the various mm. companies for the companies. And uh, I think many many boards are failing on that. Either they don't see it or they don't do anything about a a situation where you don't have the right captain. So I think that's I'm I'm saying if you as a board. That's your only really important job is to find the right captain for that ship. And if you find the right captain for the ship, well, then you can, you can enjoy the ride. And if you don't find the right captain for that ship, then, uh, well, it doesn't matter what you do. You won't fix it anyway. So, so, uh, so, but so, and that's very hard to find those captains and know when you meet them first time or second time or 10 times because I meet them multiple times before such a decision is made. It's still only a 50-50 chance that you find the right captain and you do make mm-hmm. failures all the time. You've highlighted a few points there about what a board's role is in a company, right? So I think, you know, for myself and, and you two listening this, uh, listen to this as well, what is a board? Break a board down to me because, um, you know, we all heard the board. It's not a Yola board. It's a, uh, it's, it's, it's a, a group of individuals, three to seven to nine people, depending on the size of the company, who basically help decision making in the organization from a strategy perspective. But from your perspective, having sat on so many boards, um, what what is a board, firstly, and what is its role in a company? Well, that's the, the, what the, the how boards operate are very different. Some are very passive, and some are there just just there because you need to have a board for formal reasons. And, mm-hmm. and to the other extreme where the board sometimes run the companies. And in my mind, uh, both those uh, extremes are very harmful for a company and very wrong. Mm-hmm. A board is there to, to, to secure that the company has a good leader, number one, to support that leader and the processes of strategy and funding and and uh, uh, plans and some, some, some level of control around the business. 
That's really mm-hmm. the, the, the role of the board. The, the board's role is to represent the owners of the company. They are chosen by the owners of the company, and they are there because the owners cannot be there day to day to follow up. But that's why you have a board. And again, so, so it's, it's as simple as that. Um, they are the owner's representative to secure that the company has the right leader and have a good strategy. So then that's a perfect transition into what is a good leader, Guy. You uh, meet so many different companies on probably a weekly basis. Uh, what is a good leader is a question we hear a lot on this show. So I'll ask you, I'll let you answer that one. And then I, I would like to actually transfer into what is a bad leader? Because we talk so much about what is good leadership, but also what is bad leadership? Is it micromanaging? But firstly, uh, what is a good leader to you? A uh, good leader to... to- to put it short, I would say a good leader is a person that are able to set the direction for a company or an organization or whatever that person leads and and create ownership for that direction in the, amongst the members of that team, amongst the owners, amongst the board and the society around that company and to, to make uh, people enthusiastic about those that direction and those goals. I think... If you have that, that, maybe that's 50% of what a good leader is, of course, and then you have to execute. So the second part of that is to make sure that the company organization, um, the middle leaders, uh, the employees, are that you are maximizing the chance of, of uh, executing on that direction and those goals and uh, making sure that you set up the organization and the people to be at their best. Mm-hmm. Do you believe that people can be born a leader? Yes, I think so. I think the best leaders are born like that. Um, mm-hmm. And the best leaders are not always leaders in, in the sense that they are actually having a formal leadership position. And one example of that is my co-founder, I was, uh, I would think, a pretty good or strong appreciated leader in my second startup. But equally much, I had a, I had a co-pilot or a co-founder. Uh, there was three of them, but in, in particular one who, who didn't, who, who never wanted to have people le- to be responsible for people. He was uh, denied that all the time. He could have done a good job, I think, but he denied that, didn't ever wanted that. But he was by nature and by the person he was, a leadership pers- person in that company uh, nearly at the level that I was as the, as the CEO of the company. So, so leaders, mm-hmm. and he is a born leader, and not all of them wants to, to be a formal leader. But uh, So yes, I think they are more born that way than developed that way. But, but of course, both it, applies. Yeah, fair enough. Would you say that you were born a leader or did you learn to be one? Yes, in my case, both as well. I didn't, I didn't never viewed upon myself as a leader uh, at any time in my life until, uh, until we, I was about to start my first company together with two colleagues from from uh, Sintef, a research institution we worked at. I was, tw- mm-hmm. we were twenty seven years old at the time, and we started that company. And uh, I remember we had a meeting uh, together uh, one evening to plan some stuff, including discuss who should be the leader of the company and i was very much prepared to take to choose any one of those two uh, as a leader and i didn't, didn't imagine that i should lead the company but they both of them said i should lead the company and that was a surprise to me um but i think they saw something in me actually that i didn't see myself at that time mm-hmm. we speak so much about what is a good leader and how to be a good leader um but you have obviously seen many leaders, uh, not to name names, but what is your imp- opinion of a bad leader uh, and how can we avoid making those kind of mistakes? Because I think it's quite a fine line. You know, it's a gray area often that a leader should have control of the business, but not too much control. You know, it's, it's, so where do you set the bar? So what's your experience with bad leadership? And, and if you've got any tips there for how we can avoid making the same mistakes? So... W- from my own experience, I think those leaders who prevail are have those ingredients that I just described, plus uh, mm-hmm. a, 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 a high level of transparency. So if they they should be self confident enough to be able to admit when something is wrong, when they come short, 
when they failed. And I should, in my mind, spend more time on talking about those things with the board um, than to bribe about all those things that goes well. Uh, so, but so here it comes to where my ex- uh, experience where leaders fail, and that is when they try to make a an image of the company and their um, may, and maybe themselves to be kind of world class uh, and h- kind of not deliberately, but still hide uh, hide the real situation <coughs> and. Well, they don't, they, that doesn't make them uh, poor people because that's very natural to do these things. But it's a, I think it can become very, very <coughs> challenging and very bad for a company if you have a leader who, uh, who are presenting just a, just a pretty image of the company. So transparency is a key one, obviously, to be honest and open. But I mean, it must be tough to be transparent when things are going wrong, right? You know, especially when you're talking to your board. Uh, and your employees, um, is honesty always the right route or yeah. should you in my, sort of tell in my some world, white yes, lies? Always the right way. And uh, I try mm. to live like that. It's hard sometimes to live like that because, and, and we have in, 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 we have some values in Firda and one of them is to be brutally honest uh, about things. And, mm-hmm. and we live that. And that's, that's sometimes very challenging because sometimes it's hard to be that brutally honest, but over over the long term is always the best and that creates uh, trust and trust is magically important between a board and a leader or between any people to to uh, to have a successful path are there any mantras you live your life by uh, in the many leadership roles that you have mantras yeah, yeah. Are there any sort of yeah, it must be the br- brutal honesty. Uh, just mm. say things the way it is and uh, don't try to make things look better than they are. You should definitely mm. celebrate when things go well, but uh, but stay focused on the problems because if you, co- if you continue to solve them, then the company will be successful in the end. It's as simple as that. If you solve all problems, first you have to identify those problems and you solve them, you are successful. It's as simple as that. Mm. I wanted to ask you as, uh, you know, someone who's got their finger on the vein of new age technologies, right? Very disruptive technologies, which is even the name of one of the companies you're, you're involved in. What are you excited about today in the world of technology? I'm not very excited about technology. Uh, so I don't, I don't feel any excitement of any kind of technology. I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm, but, I, but I'm excited about I'm worried about the the world and how we are and how we are explo- ex- exploiting that world. So I'm, I'm I've become more and more excited about how technology can help fix that, the purpose of technology, and to fix that because it, basically it's the the technology that has brought us into these problems. The, by the industrial, starting with the industrial revolution and and <coughs> go and go, be, uh, but. Likely, technology is what's going to needs to happen to to solve it as well. So that gives me excitement. How technology can solve real problem for people for the earth. What kind of problems do you believe need solving right now? I mean, obviously, we know that Norway has a strong foothold when it comes to impact and sustainability, um, purely because the nation has been uh, investing and in going green from having electric vehicles around the nation by, you know, 20, 2030 or 2050, we want to have a completely electric vehicle nation to stat oil rebranding to Equinor and going green and all these kind of things. But what's uh, what areas are you investing in that we should also look into? Because I think a lot of the people listening to this podcast, I know you are thinking this maybe, uh, or watching this right now, um, are in uh, beginning, middle, maybe even at the end of their career in some cases. And, you know, we've all been told the rhetoric it's so many time and time again of how important sustainability and impact is in our day-to-day lives. And I know that a lot of us want to live our lives with more purpose today. Um, but what areas should we focus in? What areas are you looking to invest in to, as you say, help humanity using technology uh, to leverage that? Well, first of all, I, I I will answer your question, but first I would like to say I don't agree with you that uh, we are a good example. Norway is a good example of uh, mm. um, of sustainability. We are probably the the, the the nation in the world who has exploited the, the world most, right? Because we are the, mm. become the richest people on the earth, and the the single reason, the single only reason for that is we have served served the world with oil and gas. And that is a huge part of the world problem is how we how we depend upon fossil fuel. 
So I don't agree with you. And uh, well, yeah, electro- electronic electric cars. Yeah, that's a good that's a good one. Uh, <laughs> but beyond that, I don't see much how we are such a great nation in these terms. No, not even actually, today. Actually, I mean, I'm you, actually you... ashamed of being a Norwegian in this sense uh, because we have so much resources and we have, have yeah. become rich by exploiting the world, number one, and we are doing so little. So I'm actually very ashamed of that. Um, when it but comes, isn't that isn't that it, it, that's an, I mean, obviously, yes. Norway has, of course, made its money from exploiting the the, the North Sea oil reserves, right? Uh, become mm-hmm. rich from that. However, if you were look at Norway from the perspective of the sovereign wealth fund and its impact on global equities, now you are as a board member, of course. Now, you know, the, the Norway owns one point five to two percent of the global equity market, correct? Right, like because it's invested in all the indexes. Now, Norway as a nation has used that role, uh, that that role on the board to influence companies. Um, sustainability and equality, right? By saying that you should have an equal board, so I, I do totally I agree, agree that. Of I, I course, agree on that. Yes. Yeah. Mm. So there mm. are there are there are examples of things that doesn't comply with my general statement, but in general, yeah. I think uh, I'm ashamed still. Okay. All right. Well, because I, we could I, do, we could have anyone... done so much more. That's my point. Yeah. But I also at the same time. Um, sh- to move on and and you know solve the world's problems, a lot of it is about forgiving and forgetting. I think yeah. you know, and yes, of course, Norway's been bad, um, but it's go- it's doing well now. And I mean, I see examples, organisations like She, right? She Community is the is Europe's largest gender diversity movement. Um, and they have the largest events. They have the largest network of organizations that came out of Oslo. Um, we also have uh, Catapult, which is the um, impact accelerator. Catapult Ocean, Catapult Accelerator in Oslo, Norway, which is the premier accelerator for impact-focused companies in the world, um, both in ocean and others. Um, so, and, and Norway in 2018, 19 you know, was was obviously listed as the the number one green capital in Europe. So I think you know there there is a point where we have to forgive and forget, and there is a point where we have to go. Okay, yes, we have the resources, as you quite rightly said. Um, I'd be curious to know if anyone listening to this right now is also involved in the impact world, and there's some initiatives you think we should take a look at too. So let us know, as I said at the beginning of this, at She Community or uh, hit me up at Matt C Smith. Um, but guy, you were mentioning a follow up to that about um, what are the areas that we should focus in? What is the solution? Well, yeah, that's that's the hard one, right? And um, but it's, the solutions are, of course, the, the, how we produce energy is, uh, is is something that you just have to fix, right? And that mm-hmm. is, uh, and there there's, there's, there's there is enough energy in the world. The sun the sun gives us fifteen thousand times more energy every day than we humans consume. So just about directly indirectly uh, use that. Um, and so, and we things that many good things have happened, right? We have got solar energy, we got wind energy, and we and the remaining problem is is storage, uh, which is about batteries and it's about likely hydrogen. So there are those are two two vectors where the world need to uh, needs to uh, to change, and um, that's why I chose to invest in a new startup just just recently, just a month ago, uh, with a hydrogen company, High Star who's going to mm-hmm. revolutionize how we can produce green hydrogen. So that's that's exciting. And uh, and yes, probably, hopefully that will be a successful uh, company. But I'm also hoping that it has a great impact on the society and the world. So, mm-hmm. so uh, energy is one. Um, food, how we produce food is a major problem uh, because the, mm. it's a major problem because of for climate. But also a major problem for biodiversity, uh, because we the farming industry is occupying enormous areas. So we have to produce food, um, and the, and the number of people in the earth is growing. So we have to produce mm. more food, uh, uh, but but in a much more sustainable way, where there is more space for nature, and that's a big challenge. And that's why, and, and there I think it's uh, it's about uh, using the, the ocean, uh, using the sea much more. And that is not my idea, of course. That's that's an <laughs> acknowledged idea about the important. Only we humans, uh, only three percent of the food we eat is is from the sea, and about mm. half of that is uh, is wild, catched, wild catch, and half of that is uh, is farmed. 
And and so it's kind of a common said all growing need of food in the world needs to come from the sea and sea farming. Mm-hmm. So that's why I just recently engaged in that as well. I think sea farming is uh, is an in, uh, enormously important piece of uh, and, and sustainable so because the salmon farming in Norway is not bad, but it's not sustainable as it is today. And that industry has to change. And I think also technology. Uh, that tech- so in my mind, the ag- agriculture, sorry, the aquaculture industry is about uh, around 1815 to 1900 developed when it comes to technology. They are very far mm. behind on the industry. And I think there's an enormous potential in that industry to make that more sustainable, more effective, mm-hmm. and become a, become a much bigger source of food for the world. And then it's uh, about and then it's about transport and everything around that and how we do that today. And that, that's a big challenge because most of the transport today is based by fossil fuel, which again is a, is a big climate problem. And mm. um, some of them has become electric cars. That's nice. Some, but we, it's hard to make electric planes, at least that goes far. And, it's, and we have electric ships, but only those who are ferries who are crossing a fjord. For longer distances, that's not applicable. So, and that's probably also where hydro- hydrogen again will be a, 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 a an important solution to get out of the fossil fuel for also transport. And if you fix all those those three elements, and and in parallel, are are fixing the biodiversity issue, then you come a, far, a big way. But then again, we have mm-hmm. a, a we have a, a, a last remaining big challenge in the world, and that is uh, and that's we've seen. I think that's which is the fundamental reason why U.S. seems to collapse from a political point of view. And that is because simply because the difference between rich and poor are just growing and growing. And that's, that's going to end up in, uh, and, and in this, this stab- distability, dissonance, distability, mm. worst case war or, uh, or revolutions. People, won't, people, people will sustain differences as long as everyone gets it better all the time. Like we have in Norway, where there's not much fr- much friction in Norway, despite the fact that the difference between rich and poor are increasing here as well. We accept it mm. because everyone gets it better. But immediately when that not, that's not applicable anymore, and some group, larger group gets it worse, then the trouble starts. Then we choose, then the people choose uh, uh, bad leaders again, like Trump, and uh, bad things happen and the society can fall apart. And that's something that I don't really understand how rich people are thinking because they seem to be uh, they seem to be in general I'm a rich person so I'm talking for myself as well they don't seem to understand this problem because they just argue against all forms of tax all the time and they they argue against wealth tax they argue against all sorts of tax and uh, I think it's a very narrow perspective it's a stable society will depend upon long term that they they the differences between people are not that big. That's that's really one of the biggest challenges we have in in, in, in the world these days. Mm-hmm. Wow, Guy, okay. that was a that was an impassioned statement you made there. Many things to touch on. Uh, are there things that others and other nations can learn from Norway in that? You mentioned how we obviously have had a socialist nation for, for, for generations, right? Um, everybody is okay. You know, everyone earns uh, around three, four, five hundred thousand knock, right? Like that, it's, it's a very high average salary and not many people earn over two million apart from a, a 1%, y- your friends, I guess. Um, it, yes, I, the answer is yes, but, and, but I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's not going the right direction. So, so that, a topic that many rich people are are engaged in is the wealth mm. tax. They they f- feel it's a, it's an unfair tax. That's the that's how it's presented, and it should be taxed differently. But I think it's a. And what I've come to is that it's a completely necessary tax to to secure that the difference are just not growing and growing and growing. There needs to be a rebalancing of fortune between people, and you just have to take from the rich and give to the to the more. To, and give it to the state, and the state can distribute those wealth to the people. And I think that's the only way you can uh, you can actually avoid the difference to to, to just increase, and increase. Or you can just wait for the next next war to come about. Which uh, that's the only thing that is historically has rebalanced wealth in the world. It's, it's big wars, like Second World War, was a big rebalance. Do so you think there's a war coming? 
yes, if we don't solve these problems, I, I do think uh, the war, yes, definitely, the war will come. That's why it's so important. We have to, to have to start solving this on a continuous basis, not building up to the crisis. Because obviously right now with COVID, there is going to be a further disparity and further imbalance in wealth divide, right? Those who were lucky enough yeah. to be in an industry that'll survive, those who are lucky enough to keep their jobs, yeah. and that's just the normal people. Then we obviously have the majority of the already low income workers in bars and restaurants and cafes who have obviously lost their jobs, lost their income. Government stepped in for a period of time. I'm currently in Spain when I'm recording this, right? And uh, all the bars and restaurants closed in a second lockdown a few months ago. Um, uh, they've opened again, but th there was no stimulus. There was no stimulus given to them. There were riots here. There were, there were fires in the squares. But I ask you then, this show's about leadership, Guy. If you were in the leadership seat, what would you do? You seem like an informed guy. You seem like you have a, a, a weighted opinion in this. What would you do if you were leading right now? If I were leading, if you were what, leading, if I were leading, if you were Norway, leading a nation, or, uh, if you, for if, instance, yes, exactly. Hypothetically, hypothetically if, if Anna Solberg said, hey, Guy, you got this one. If I was a dictator in Norway, what, <laughs> what would, would I do? do? That's that the question. <laughs> okay. You don't have to be a dictator. I thought it was a democracy, but what would you do? Uh, that's yeah. hard. That's the problem. The also, the, the, the democracy is a necessity, but it's also a problem because it's hard to make those hard choices. But anyway. But hold on. Um, no, I, don't I want to stay on that one. Well, I, I, would, use, I would use, I would use, I would use, I would say we have earned all those money on uh, become the richest people in the world. It's now our destiny and our obligation to use that for the better good. Mm -hmm. And by, while, of course, creating new industries and new, uh, new export industries, we can live off because that's, you have to, we have to have uh, a society that works and we have to have a future and we have to do business and we have to earn money and we have to export things, preferably more than we import or at least mm -hmm. as much, and, which is going to be a big challenge for Norway when the oil and gas goes away. Um, so I would say we have we are in a, in a unique position. We have we own two percent of the stocks Correct. in the world. We have an enormous wealth compared to we are 0.1 percent of the population in the world, and we own two percent of the world. Uh, kind of, that's not true totally because not all not all stocks are no. public. But, um, but we get you, yeah. But anyway, so so use that to to make a direction and make a change and and set some set some priorities and missions on what needs to happen in the in Norway and the world and and try to go that way and s s create incentives the fundament the research uh incentives to develop those areas and then guy will invest in you developing in those areas too i'm doing that yeah. too today mm. yes uh but it's of course i can do uh, this much of uh, mm. this small impact but i'm um, I'm Let trying. me throw that question to you then, Guy. You know, we have a, a lot of CEOs on the show. Uh, we're several podcasts in right now. We have many more coming. Uh, what is your message to other leaders out there um, along the lines of what you've just impassionately spoken about? Well, that's a, that's a hard one. Um, of course, the, 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 the mission of a leader is to make the best possible outcome for that organization or that company they lead for the for the for the better for the this their shareholders their employees and the society mm -hmm. um and and so that's always what a leader should do but uh more so even is to see how your company and your organization can do a bit better job for the bigger questions and some some companies are more set up to do an, a direct impact. But I think we are all possible to do an impact in a better way we do. Like Equinor is doing. I don't admire Equinor because I think they are painting their company green, changing the name and paint, painting them green. They don't, they don't really care about offshore wind, I believe. Uh, this, this, that's a tough statement, of course, to say, but it, it appears to be like that. I, I have but to... I think to... they should really start care. Yeah. They should really start thinking. We have to, at some point, we just need to stop explore uh, oil mm. and gas exploration. Mm. So we need to just seriously start to do other things or plan our own death. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not trying to defend Equinor in any way, but the one thing I've learned in the last sort of nine months or so is how important, you know, 
empathy and w in the beginning of this year we had all these global hackathons that were an initiative set up by uh, the Tallinn startup ecosystem right Noi was the third one I hosted that the European Commission supported it Oslo Community got involved it was a great initiative uh, what a hackathon is for those of you who don't know is it's basically an idea earth marathon so you have people who get together from all walks of life come up with ideas to save lives save communities and save businesses caused by the COVID crisis, right? And the one running thread that came out of all the conversations with the people who were the head of the European Commission to the head of PwC and all these enormous organizations, multi-billion dollars, was having empathy. And at, we're in a position in the world right now where we can rebuild from the beginning effectively because you know a lot of industries have been completely demised and we need to rebuild with equality diversity and and sustainability at the core of everything we do so you know having a mindset around empathy and forgive and forget i think is something that is so relevant today so yes i agree that ecuador have been a bad a bad naughty kid along the years of sure as many companies have done but even nestle for example nestle have done some bad things in the past and they're writing the ship um but don't don't misinterpret mm. me. I don't uh, I don't think we should uh, feel guilt. No. I think we just should use be ashamed mm. enough to do it to do it better going mm -hmm. forward. Okay. Be, uh, that's fair enough. That's fair enough. But that's a perfect transition to, uh, to our last comment. As you know, this podcast is brought to everyone listening by the She Community, um, who are on a mission to increase the uh, gender economic parity, um, equality in every measure. And they're doing a great job of that through many initiatives. Now, one element to that is the She Index, which is a list of companies in Norway. Um, and they're scaling that, supported by... Um, uh, several organizations to decide and rank them on the most equal uh, companies, uh, how women uh, on and any individual can progress through their career in that company. Equality. Uh, let me ask you that question. What is equality to you, Gaia? It's as simple as equal opportunities and, and uh, e equal opportunities among, among, um, Gender, of course, equal opportunity within uh, across religions, across color of your skin, across your sexual preferences, uh, and between the rich and poor, mm. right? Which is not the case. So I think that it, the equality is a big, uh, and I would I would even go so far, but here here I'm about to become extreme. Equality between you could say equality between species. Why, why, are, why are we humans so damn important? Uh, what about the animals? And, and, and of course, you can get crazy by starting thinking about that. But, but I think it's, it's, a, it's a wide topic. What do you mean? How uh, would you make things? I mean, I understand, of course, we are the dominant species and we've taken advantage of that up until 20 years ago, to be honest. You know, there, up until only 20 years ago, organizations, UN, World Health Organization, really started to focus on those areas of uh, species equality. But what do you mean? So, so, so I think we human has to. Uh, we tend to put ourselves in the in the center of the universe, of course, and on the earth, and uh, we have a, kind of we have a value by our mm. own. A, a human being has a value by its own, right? And that, and I, of course, I agree mm. to that. But why don't uh, uh, shouldn't uh, any kind of animal have that value? And and but we don't look at it that way, right? We look at them uh, as our. And now I'm starting to seem extreme. I'm, I'm, I'm not at all. I, I go hunting and I eat meat less now than before, uh, but, uh, but I do all those things. So, um, and I catch fishes and all those things. So, but, but I have a trouble, I have sometimes a trouble to really agree on how much we, we, we lift ourselves as humans. Mm. Why are we so important actually? Mm. Uh, isn't that the, the, uh, I'm starting to view the, the world's ecosystems to be of a much bigger value and how things are working together as a much bigger value than, than, than humans itself. That's a really interesting thought. Equality across species, Gaia. That's a tough one, a right? Tough one. What a way to finish as well, Guy. Thank you so much. I just wanted to sum up a few things there, um, like I always like to do. Um, that's been a really impassioned conversation, Guy. I really appreciate you, you joining on this one. I wonder what your thoughts are listening or watching this. Um, let us know. Uh, uh, let us know if you thought there was a challenging comment in there you'd like to challenge. Um, 
Transparency and honesty, Guy, that's what it comes down to. Being a leader, being uh, an impassioned member of society today is all about having transparency and being honest through and through. I think that's a lesson that is, is known but can be reminded and is often forgotten throughout everything that you do. And that, that can be something like something as simple as I always find honesty, like how to be more honest and how to be more transparent is something that's quite difficult to do because what is honesty and what is transparency? I mean, apart from just always telling the truth, for me, uh, you know, we all tell, I think there was a statistic that said we all tell like 20 to 30 lies a day. And those lies are something like, hey, Gaia, I'll get back to you tomorrow you know, with something that you've asked for. But, you know, I haven't really given it too much thought that I'm not going to get that email to you tomorrow because I'm busy and I'm busy today and busy tomorrow. That's a small white lie, okay? It's not hurting any hurt anyone, but maybe you uh, do this regularly. I've done this regularly. Uh, you know, we've all been a flake. I'm not yeah? actually, I'm not actually. I'm, I tried, to, and that's one of my values in life, to not yeah. do that. To not say I'm sending you an email mm. tomorrow if I know I'm not going to send you an email. But of course, I sometimes say I, can, I will send you an email tomorrow <laughs> And I didn't make mm. it, but then I try to do it the next day or apologize after. So I, I try to be, actually, it's hard. And, and of course, I fail all the time too, but not, not, not lie just to yeah. lie. And, and that's the point I'm trying to make, that I, I've, I've, I've recognized myself doing that in their past so many times. You know, we all have a flaky friend who's always free to meet up and then they never actually do. And then, you know, over time that builds mm. up. So I think a good place to start is just to start to be aware of the times that you do that. So I've also even done that, for example, where I, you know, I, I realized that I've wanted to get that, that email to that person. It's, it's Monday today and I wanted to get it to them by Wednesday. And I realized on Tuesday night that it's not going to happen. I drop them an email and say, hey, just want to let you know, you know, get to be there by Friday because it's better to be the first person to ask than the, 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 the person chases you right so that's just a small example I think a business example we can all take mm. example from but and it makes your life so much easier mm. right because then you don't have to feel bad conscious about something and you get it off you get it off your mm. chest and you don't disappoint that person <laughs> because you were frank with him guy thank you and you build trust. Exactly. It's all about building trust. Honesty, transparency. I'm going to finish it there because this has been a long, passionate one. I know my, I've know got lots of thoughts that I want to take home with me from this one. Guy, thank you so much for joining Breakfast with the CEO. Uh, I've been your host, Matt C. Smith, and I look forward to seeing you and hearing to anyone who is interested to learn more about these topics. I'll see you in the next episode. Cheers.